Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter One. Treats of the place where Oliver Twist was born, and of the circumstances attending his birth. Among other public buildings in a certain town, which for many reasons it will be prudent to refrain from mentioning, and to which I will assign no fictitious name, there is one anciently common to most towns, great or small, to wit, a workhouse. And in this workhouse was born, on a day and date which I need not trouble myself to repeat, inasmuch as it can be of no possible consequence to the reader, in this stage of the business at all events, the item of mortality whose name is prefixed to the head of this chapter. For a long time after it was ushered into this world of sorrow and trouble by the parish surgeon, it remained a matter of considerable doubt whether the child would survive to bear any name at all, in which case it is somewhat more than probable that these memoirs would never have appeared, or, if they had, that being comprised within a couple of pages, they would have possessed the inestimable merit of being the most concise and faithful specimen of biography extant in the literature of any age or country. Although I am not disposed to maintain that the being born in a workhouse is in itself the most fortunate and enviable circumstance that can possibly befall a human being, I do mean to say that, in this particular instance, it was the best thing for Oliver Twist that could by possibility have occurred. The fact is, that there was considerable difficulty in inducing Oliver to take upon himself the office of respiration, a troublesome practice, but one which custom has rendered necessary to our easy existence, and for some time he lay gasping on a little flock mattress, rather unequally poised between this world and the next, the balance being decidedly in favour of the latter. Now, if during this brief period Oliver had been surrounded by careful grandmothers, anxious aunts, experienced nurses, and doctors of profound wisdom, he would most inevitably and indubitably have been killed in no time. There being nobody by, however, but a pauper old woman, who was rendered rather misty by an unwonted allowance of beer, and a parish surgeon who did such matters by contract, Oliver and Nature fought out the point between them. The result was that after a few struggles, Oliver breathed sneezed, and proceeded to advertise to the inmates of the workhouse the fact of a new burden having been imposed upon the parish, by setting up as loud a cry as could reasonably have been expected from a male infant who had not been possessed of that very useful appendage, a voice, for a much longer space of time than three minutes and a quarter. As Oliver gave this first proof of the free and proper action of his lungs, the patchwork coverlet which was carelessly flung over the iron bedstead rustled. The pale face of a young woman was raised feebly from the pillow, and a faint voice imperfectly articulated the words, "'Let me see the child, and die.' The surgeon had been sitting with his face turned towards the fire, giving the palms of his hands a warm and a rub alternately. As the young woman spoke, he rose and advanced to the bed's head, said with more kindness than might have been expected of him. "'Oh, you must not talk about dying yet.' "'Law bless her, dear heart, no,' interposed the nurse, hastily depositing in her pocket a green glass bottle, the contents of which she had been tasting in a corner with evident satisfaction. "'Law bless her, dear heart, when she has lived as long as I have, sir, and had thirteen children of her own, and all on him dead except two, and them in the workers with me, she'll know better than to take on in that way, bless her, dear heart. Think what it is to be a mother, there's a dear young lamb, do.' Apparently this consolatory perspective of a mother's prospects failed in producing its due effect. The patient shook her head, and stretched out her hand towards the child. The surgeon deposited it in her arms. She imprinted her cold white lips passionately on its forehead, passed her hands over her face, gazed wildly round, shuddered, fell back, and died. They chafed her breast, hands, and temples, but the blood had stopped for ever. They talked of hope and comfort. They had been strangers too long. 
"'It's all over, Mrs. Thingamy,' said the surgeon at last. "'Ah, oh, poor dear, so it is,' said the nurse, picking up the cork of the green bottle, which had fallen out on the pillow as she stooped to take up the child. "'Poor dear!' "'You needn't mind sending up to me if the child cries, nurse.' said the surgeon, putting on his gloves with great deliberation. "'It's very likely it will be troublesome. Give it a little gruel, if it is.' He put on his hat, and, pausing by the bedside on his way to the door, added, "'She was a good-looking girl, too. Where did she come from?' "'She was brought here last night,' replied the old woman, "'by the overseer's order. She was found lying in the street.' She had walked some distance, for her shoes were worn to pieces, but where she came from, or where she was going to, nobody knows." The surgeon leaned over the body, and raised the left hand. "'Ah, the old story,' he said, shaking his head. "'No wedding ring. Now see. Ah. <laughs> Good night.' The medical gentleman walked away to dinner and the nurse, having once more applied herself to the green bottle, sat down on a low chair before the fire, and proceeded to dress the infant. What an excellent example of the power of dress young Oliver Twist was! Wrapped in the blanket which had hitherto formed his only covering, he might have been the child of a nobleman, or a beggar. It would have been hard for the haughtiest stranger to have assigned him his proper station in society. But now that he was enveloped in the old calico robes, which had grown yellow in the same service, he was badged and ticketed, and fell into his place at once, a parish child, the orphan of a workhouse, the humble, half-starved drudge, to be cuffed and buffeted through the world, despised by all, and pitied by none. Oliver cried lustily. If he could have known that he was an orphan, left to the tender mercies of church-wardens and overseers, perhaps he would have cried the louder. CHAPTER Two OF OLIVER TWIST TREATS OF OLIVER TWIST'S GROWTH, EDUCATION, AND BOARD For the next eight or ten months, Oliver was the victim of a systematic course of treachery and deception. He was brought up by hand. The hungry and destitute situation of the infant orphan was duly reported by the workhouse authorities to the parish authorities. The parish authorities inquired with dignity of the workhouse authorities whether there was no female then domiciled in the house, who was in a situation to impart to Oliver Twist the consolation and nourishment of which he stood in need. The workhouse authorities replied, with humility, that there was not. Upon this, the parish authorities magnanimously and humanely resolved that Oliver should be farmed, or, in other words, that he should be dispatched to a branch workhouse, some three miles off, where twenty or thirty other juvenile offenders against the poor laws rolled about the floor all day, without the inconvenience of too much food, or too much clothing, under the parental superintendence of an elderly female, who received the culprits at and for the consideration of sevenpence halfpenny per small head per week. Sevenpence halfpenny's worth per week is a good round diet for a child. A great deal may be got for sevenpence halfpenny, quite enough to overload its stomach and make it uncomfortable. The elderly female was a woman of wisdom and experience. She knew what was good for children, and she had a very accurate perception of what was good for herself. So, she appropriated the greater part of the weekly stipend to her own use, and consigned the rising parochial generation to even a shorter allowance than was originally provided for them, thereby finding in the lowest depth a deeper still, and proving herself a very great experimental philosopher. Everybody knows the story of another experimental philosopher, who had a great theory about a horse being able to live without eating, and who demonstrated it so well that he had got his own horse down to a straw a day, and would unquestionably have rendered him a very spirited and rampacious animal on nothing at all, if he had not died four-and-twenty hours before he was to have had his first comfortable bait of air. Unfortunately for the experimental philosophy of the female to whose protecting care Oliver Twist was delivered over, 
A similar result usually attended the operation of her system. For at the very moment when the child had contrived to exist upon the smallest possible portion of the weakest possible food, it did perversely happen in eight and a half cases out of ten, either that it sickened from want and cold, or fell into the fire from neglect, or got half smothered by accident. In any one of which cases, the miserable little being was usually summoned into another world, and there gathered to the fathers it had never known in this. Occasionally, when there was some more than usually interesting inquest upon a parish child who had been overlooked in turning up a bedstead, or inadvertently scalded to death when there happened to be a washing, though the latter accident was very scarce, anything approaching to a washing being of rare occurrence in the farm, the jury would take it into their heads to ask troublesome questions, or the parishioners would rebelliously affix their signatures to a remonstrance but these impertinences were speedily checked by the evidence of the surgeon and the testimony of the beadle, the former of whom had always opened the body and found nothing inside, which was very probable indeed, and the latter of whom invariably swore whatever the parish wanted, which was very self-devotional. Besides, the board made periodical pilgrimages to the farm, and always sent the beadle the day before to say they were going. The children were neat and clean to behold when they went, and what more would the people have? It cannot be expected that this system of farming would produce any very extraordinary or luxuriant crop. Oliver Twist's ninth birthday found him a pale, thin child, somewhat diminutive in stature, and decidedly small in circumference. But nature or inheritance had implanted a good, sturdy spirit in Oliver's breast. It had had plenty of room to expand, thanks to the spare diet of the establishment, and perhaps to this circumstance may be attributed his having any ninth birthday at all. Be this as it may, however, it was his ninth birthday, and he was keeping it in the coal cellar with a select party of two other young gentlemen, who, after participating with him in a sound thrashing, had been locked up for atrociously presuming to be hungry, when Mrs. Mann, the good lady of the house, was unexpectedly startled by the apparition of Mr. Bumble, the beadle, striving to undo the wicket of the garden gate. "'Goodness gracious! Is that you, Mr. Bumble, sir?' said Mrs. Mann, thrusting her head out of the window in well-affected ecstasies of joy. "'Susan, take Oliver and them two brats upstairs and wash them directly.' "'Oh, my heart alive, Mr. Bumble! How glad I am to see you, surely!' Now, Mr. Bumble was a fat man, and a choleric, so instead of responding to this open-hearted salutation in a kindred spirit, he gave the little wicket a tremendous shake, and then bestowed upon it a kick, which could have emanated from no leg but a beadle's. "'Law! Only think!' said Mrs. Mann, running out for the three boys had been removed by this time. "'Only think of that! That I should have forgotten that the gate was bolted on the inside on account of them dear children. Walk in, sir. Walk in, pray, Mr. Bumble. Do, sir.' Although this invitation was accompanied with a curtsy that might have softened the heart of a churchwarden, it by no means mollified the beadle. "'Do you think this respectful or proper conduct, Mrs. Mann," inquired Mr. Bumble, grasping his cane, "'to keep the parish officers awaiting at your garden gate, when they come here upon parochial business with the parochial orphans?' "'Are you aware, Mrs. Mann, that you are, as I may say, a parochial delegate and a stipendiary? "'Oh, I'm sure, Mr. Pample, that I was only a-telling one or two of the dear children, as is so fond of you, that it was you a coming," replied Mrs. Mann, with great humility. Mr. Bumble had a great idea of his oratorical powers and his importance. He had displayed the one, and vindicated the other. He relaxed. "'Well, well, Mrs. Mann,' he replied in a calmer tone, "'It may be as you say. It may be. Lead the way in, Mrs. Mann, for I come on business and have something to say.' 
Mrs. Mann ushered the beadle into a small parlour with a brick floor, placed a seat for him, and officiously deposited his cocked hat and cane on the table before him. Mr. Bumble wiped from his forehead the perspiration which his walk had engendered, glanced complacently at the cocked hat, and smiled. Yes, he smiled. Beadles are but men, and Mr. Bumble smiled. "'Now, don't you be offended at what I'm a-going to say,' observed Mrs. Mann, with captivating sweetness. "'You've had a long walk, you know, or I would mention it. Now, will you take a little drop of something, Mr. Bumble?' "'Not a drop, nor a drop,' said Mr. Bumble, waving his right hand in a dignified but placid manner. Oh, "'I think you will,' said Mrs. Mann, who had noticed the tone of the refusal, and the gesture that had accompanied it. "'Just a little drop, with a little cold water, and a lump of sugar?' Mr. Bumble coughed. "'Now, just a little drop,' said Mrs. Mann, persuasively. "'What is it?' inquired the beadle. "'Why, it's what I'm obliged to keep a little of in the house, to put into the blessed infant's daffy, when they ain't well, Mr. Bumble,' replied Mrs. Mann, as she opened a corner cupboard and took down a bottle and glass. "'It's gin. I'll not deceive you, Mr. B. It's gin.' "'Do you give the children daffy, Mrs. Mann?' inquired Bumble following with his eyes the interesting process of mixing. "'Oh, bless em, that I do, dear as it is,' replied the nurse. "'I couldn't see him suffer before my very eyes, you know, sir.' "'No,' said Mr. Bumble approvingly. "'No, you could not. You are a humane woman, Mrs. Mann.' Here she set down the glass. I shall take an early opportunity of mentioning it to the board, Mrs. Mann. He drew it towards him. You feel as a mother, Mrs. Mann. He stirred the gin and water. I, I drink to your health with cheerfulness, Mrs. Mann. And he swallowed half of it. And now, about business, said the beadle, taking out a leathern pocket book. The child that was half baptized Oliver Twist, is nine year old today. "'Bless him!' interposed Mrs. Mann, inflaming her left eye with the corner of her apron. "'And notwithstanding half a reward of ten pounds, which was afterwards increased to twenty pound. Notwithstanding the most superlative, and I may say supernatural, exertions on the part of this parish,' said Bumble, "'We have never been able to discover who is his father, or what was his mother's settlement, name, or condition.' Mrs. Mann raised her hands in astonishment, but added, after a moment's reflection, "'How comes he to have any name at all, then?' The beadle drew himself up with great pride, and said, "'I invented it.' "'You, Mr. Bum! I, Mrs. Mann. We name our fondlings in alphabetical order. The last was a S, Swabble, I named him. This was a T, Twist, I named him. The next one comes will be Unwin, and the next Vilkins. I have got names ready-made to the end of the alphabet, and all the way through it again when we come to Z. "'Why, you're quite a literary character, sir,' said Mrs. Mann. "'Well, well,' said the beadle, evidently gratified with the compliment. "'Perhaps I may be, perhaps I may be, Mrs. Mann.' He finished the gin and water, and added, "'Oliver, being now too old to remain here, the board have determined to have him back into the house.' I have come out myself to take him there. So, let me see him at once." "'I'll fetch him directly,' said Mrs. Mann, leaving the room for that purpose. 
Oliver, having had by this time, as much of the outer coat of dirt which encrusted his face and hands removed, as could be scrubbed off in one washing, was led into the room by his benevolent protectress. "'Make a bow to the gentleman, Oliver,' said Mrs. Mann. Oliver made a bow, which was divided between the beadle on the chair and the cocked hat on the table. "'Will you go along with me, Oliver?' said Mr. Bumble, in a majestic voice. Oliver was about to say that he would go along with anybody with great readiness, when, glancing upward, he caught sight of Mrs. Mann, who had got behind the beadle's chair, and was shaking her fist at him with a furious countenance. He took the hint at once, for the fist had been too often impressed upon his body, not to be deeply impressed upon his recollection. "'Will she go with me?' inquired poor Oliver. "'No, she can't,' replied Mr. Bumble. "'But she'll come and see you sometimes.' This was no very great consolation to the child. Young as he was, however, he had sense enough to make a feint of feeling great regret at going away. It was no very difficult matter for the boy to call tears into his eyes. Hunger and recent ill-usage are great assistance if you want to cry and Oliver cried very naturally indeed. Mrs. Mann gave him a thousand embraces, and what Oliver wanted a great deal more, a piece of bread and butter, lest he should seem too hungry when he got to the workhouse. With the slice of bread and butter in his hand, and the little brown cloth parish cap on his head, Oliver was then led away by Mr. Bumble from the wretched home where one kind word or look had never lighted the gloom of his infant years and yet he burst into an agony of childish grief, as the cottage gate closed after him. Wretched as were the little companions in misery he was leaving behind, they were the only friends he had ever known, and a sense of his loneliness in the great wide world sank into the child's heart for the first time. Mr. Bumble walked on with long strides. Little Oliver, firmly grasping his gold-laced cuff, trotted beside him, inquiring at the end of every quarter of a mile, whether they were nearly there. To these interrogations Mr. Bumble returned very brief and snappish replies, for the temporary blandness which gin and water awakens in some bosoms had by this time evaporated, and he was once again a beadle. Oliver had not been within the walls of the workhouse a quarter of an hour, and had scarcely completed the demolition of a second slice of bread, when Mr. Bumble, who had handed him over to the care of an old woman, returned and, telling him it was board night, informed him that the board had said he was to appear before it forthwith. Not having a very clearly defined notion of what a live board was, Oliver was rather astounded by this intelligence, and was not quite certain whether he ought to laugh or cry. He had no time to think about the matter, however, for Mr. Bumble gave him a tap on the head, with his cane, to wake him up, and another on the back, to make him lively, and bidding him to follow, conducted him into a large, whitewashed room, where eight or ten fat gentlemen were sitting round a table. At the top of the table, seated in an armchair rather higher than the rest, was a particularly fat gentleman, with a very round, red face. "'Bow to the board,' said Bumble. Oliver brushed away two or three tears that were lingering in his eyes, and seeing no board but the table, fortunately bowed to that. "'What's your name, boy?' said the gentleman in the high chair. Oliver was frightened at the sight of so many gentlemen, which made him tremble, and the beadle gave him another tap behind, which made him cry. These two causes made him answer in a very low and hesitating voice, whereupon a gentleman in a white waistcoat said he was a fool, which was a capital way of raising his spirits and putting him quite at his ease. A boy, said the gentleman in the high chair, listen to me. "'You know you're an orphan, I suppose?' "'What's that, sir?' inquired poor Oliver. "'The boy is a fool. I thought he was,' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. "'Hush!' said the gentleman who had spoken first. "'You know you've got no father or mother, and that you were brought up by the parish, don't you?' "'Yes, sir,' replied Oliver, weeping bitterly. "'What are you crying for?' inquired the gentleman in the white waistcoat, and to be sure it was very extraordinary. What could the boy be crying for? 
"'I hope you say your prayers every night,' said another gentleman in a gruff voice, "'and pray for the people who feed you and take care of you like a Christian.' "'Yes, sir,' stammered the boy. The gentleman who spoke last was unconsciously right. It would have been very like a Christian, and a marvellously good Christian, too, if Oliver had prayed for the people who fed and took care of him. But he hadn't, because nobody had taught him. "'Well, you have come here to be educated and taught a useful trade,' said the red-faced gentleman in the high chair. "'So you'll begin to pick oakum to-morrow morning at six o'clock,' added the surly one in the white waistcoat. For the combination of both these blessings in the one simple process of picking oakum, Oliver bowed low by the direction of the beadle, and was then hurried away to a large ward, where, on a rough, hard bed, he sobbed himself to sleep. What a novel illustration of the tender laws of England! They let the paupers go to sleep. Poor Oliver! He little thought, as he lay sleeping in happy unconsciousness of all around him, that the board had that very day arrived at a decision which would exercise the most material influence over all his future fortunes. But they had. And this was it. The members of this board were very sage, deep, philosophical men, and when they came to turn their attention to the workhouse, they found out at once, what ordinary folks would never have discovered, the poor people liked it. It was a regular place of public entertainment for the poorer classes, a tavern where there was nothing to pay, a public breakfast, dinner, tea, and supper all the year round, a brick-and-mortar elysium, where it was all play and no work. Oh, said the board, looking very knowing, we are the fellows to set this to rights. We'll stop it all in no time. So they established the rule that all poor people should have the alternative, for they would compel nobody, not they, of being starved by a gradual process in the house, or by a quick one out of it. With this view, they contracted with the waterworks to lay on an unlimited supply of water, and with a corn factor to supply periodically small quantities of oatmeal, and issued three meals of thin gruel a day, with an onion twice a week and half a roll of Sundays. They made a great many other wise and humane regulations, having reference to the ladies, which it is not necessary to repeat. Kindly undertook to divorce poor married people, in consequence of the great expense of a suit in doctors' commons, and instead of compelling a man to support his family, as they had theretofore done, took his family away from him, and made him a bachelor. There is no saying how many applicants for relief, under these last two heads, might have started up in all classes of society, if it had not been coupled with the workhouse. But the board were long-headed men, and had provided for this difficulty. The relief was inseparable from the workhouse and the gruel, and that frightened people. For the first six months after Oliver Twist was removed, the system was in full operation. It was rather expensive at first in consequence of the increase in the undertaker's bill, and the necessity of taking in the clothes of all the paupers which fluttered loosely on their wasted, shrunken forms after a week or two's gruel. But the number of workhouse inmates got thin as well as the paupers, and the board were in ecstasies. The room in which the boys were fed was a large stone hall with a copper at one end, out of which the master, dressed in an apron for the purpose, and assisted by one or two women, ladled the gruel at meal-times. Of this festive composition, each boy had one porringer, and no more, except on occasions of great public rejoicing, when he had two ounces and a quarter of bread besides. The bowls never wanted washing. The boys polished them with their spoons till they shone again, and when they had performed this operation, which never took very long, the spoons being nearly as large as the bowls, they would sit staring at the copper, with such eager eyes, as if they could have devoured the very bricks of which it was composed, employing themselves, meanwhile, in sucking their fingers most assiduously, with the view of catching up any stray splashes of gruel that might have been cast thereon. Boys have generally excellent appetites, 
Oliver Twist and his companions, suffered the tortures of slow starvation for three months. At last they got so voracious and wild with hunger, that one boy, who was tall for his age, and hadn't been used to that sort of thing, for his father had kept a small cook-shop, hinted darkly to his companions, that unless he had another basin of gruel per diem, he was afraid he might some night happen to eat the boy who slept next to him, who happened to be a weakly youth of tender age. He had a wild, hungry eye, and they implicitly believed him. A council was held. Lots were cast. Who should walk up to the master after supper that evening, and ask for more? And it fell to Oliver Twist. The evening arrived. The boys took their places. The master, in his cook's uniform, stationed himself at the copper. His pauper assistants ranged themselves behind him. The gruel was served out, and a long grace was said over the short commons. The gruel disappeared. The boys whispered each other, and winked at Oliver, while his next neighbours nudged him. Child as he was, he was desperate with hunger, and reckless with misery. He rose from the table, and advancing to the master, basin and spoon in hand, said, somewhat alarmed at his own temerity, "'Please, sir, I want some more.' The master was a fat, healthy man, but he turned very pale. He gazed in stupefied astonishment on the small rebel for some seconds, and then clung for support to the copper. The assistants were paralysed with wonder, the boys with fear. "'What?' said the master at length, in a faint voice. "'Please, sir,' replied Oliver, "'I want some more.' The master aimed a blow at Oliver's head with the ladle pinioned him in his arm, and shrieked aloud for the beadle. The board was sitting in solemn conclave, when Mr. Bumble rushed into the room in great excitement, and addressing the gentleman in the high chair, said, "'Mr. Lemkins, I beg your pardon, sir. Oliver Twist has asked for more.' There was a general start. Horror was depicted on every countenance. "'For more?' said Mr. Lemkins. "'Compose yourself, Bumble, and answer me distinctly. Do I understand that he asked for more, after he had eaten the supper allotted by the dietary?' "'He did, sir,' replied Bumble. "'That boy will be hung,' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. "'I know that boy will be hung.' Nobody controverted the prophetic gentleman's opinion. An animated discussion took place. Oliver was ordered into instant confinement, and a bill was next morning pasted on the outside of the gate, offering a reward of five pounds to anybody who would take Oliver Twist off the hands of the parish. In other words, five pounds and Oliver Twist were offered to any man or woman who wanted an apprentice to any trade, business, or calling. "'I never was more convinced of anything in my life,' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat as he knocked at the gate, and read the bill next morning, "'I never was more convinced of anything in my life than I am that that boy will come to be hung.' As I purpose to show in the sequel whether the white waistcoated gentleman was right or not, I should perhaps mar the interest of this narrative, supposing it to possess any at all, if I ventured to hint just yet whether the life of Oliver Twist had this violent termination or no. Chapter Three of Oliver Twist relates how Oliver Twist was very near getting a place which would not have been a sinecure. For a week after the commission of the impious and profane offence of asking for more, Oliver remained a close prisoner in the dark and solitary room to which he had been consigned by the wisdom and mercy of the board. It appears at first sight not unreasonable to suppose that if he had entertained a becoming feeling of respect for the prediction of the gentleman in the white waistcoat, he would have established that sage individual's prophetic character, once and for ever, by tying one end of his pocket-handkerchief to a hook in the wall, and attaching himself to the other. To the performance of this feat, however, there was one obstacle, namely, that pocket-handkerchiefs being decided articles of luxury, had been for all future times and ages removed from the noses of paupers 
by the express order of the board, in council assembled, solemnly given and pronounced under their hands and seals. There was a still greater obstacle in Oliver's youth and childishness. He only cried bitterly all day, and, when the long dismal night came on, spread his little hands before his eyes to shut out the darkness, and crouching in the corner, tried to sleep, ever and anon waking with a start and tremble, and drawing himself closer and closer to the wall, as if to feel even its cold hard surface were a protection in the gloom and loneliness which surrounded him. Let it not be supposed by the enemies of the system, that, during the period of his solitary incarceration, Oliver was denied the benefits of exercise, the pleasure of society, or the advantages of religious consolation. As for exercise, it was nice cold weather, and he was allowed to perform his ablutions every morning under the pump, in a stone yard, in the presence of Mr. Bumble, who prevented his catching cold, and caused a tingling sensation to pervade his frame by repeated applications of the cane. As for society, he was carried every other day into the hall where the boys dined, and there sociably flogged as a public warning and example. And so far from being denied the advantages of religious consolation, he was kicked into the same apartment every evening at prayer-time, and there permitted to listen to, and console his mind, with a general supplication of the boys, containing a special clause therein inserted by authority of the board, in which they entreated to be made good, virtuous, contented, and obedient, and to be guarded from the sins and vices of Oliver Twist, whom the supplication distinctly set forth to be under the exclusive patronage and protection of the powers of wickedness, and an article direct from the manufactory of the very devil himself. It chanced one morning, while Oliver's affairs were in this auspicious and comfortable state, that Mr. Gamfield, chimney-sweep, went his way down the high street, deeply cogitating in his mind his ways and means of paying certain arrears of rent, for which his landlord had become rather pressing. Mr. Gamfield's most sanguine estimate of his finances could not raise them within full five pounds of the desired amount, and, in a species of arithmetical desperation, he was alternately cudgelling his brains and his donkey, when passing the workhouse his eyes encountered the bill on the gate. Whoa! said Mr. Gamfield to the donkey. The donkey was in a state of profound abstraction, wondering, probably, whether he was destined to be regaled with a cabbage stalk or two, when he had disposed of the two sacks of soot with which the little cart was laden. So, without noticing the word of command, he jogged onward. Mr. Gamfield growled a fierce imprecation on the donkey generally, but more particularly on his eyes, and, running after him, bestowed a blow on his head which would inevitably have beaten in any skull but a donkey's. Then, catching hold of the bridle, he gave his jaw a sharp wrench, by way of gentle reminder that he was not his own master, and by these means turned him round. He then gave him another blow on the head, just to stun him till he came back again. Having completed these arrangements, he walked up to the gate to read the bill. The gentleman with the white waistcoat was standing at the gate with his hands behind him, after having delivered himself of some profound sentiments in the board-room. Having witnessed the little dispute between Mr. Gamfield and the donkey, he smiled joyously when that person came up to read the bill, for he saw at once that Mr. Gamfield was exactly the sort of master Oliver Twist wanted. Mr. Gamfield smiled, too, as he perused the document, for five pounds was just the sum he had been wishing for, and as to the boy with which it was encumbered, Mr. Gamfield, knowing what the dietary of the workhouse was, well knew he would be a nice small pattern, just the very thing for register stoves. So he spelt the bill through again, from beginning to end, and then, touching his fur cap in token of humility, accosted the gentleman in the white waistcoat. "'This here boy, sir, what the parish wants to prentice,' said Mr. Gamfield. "'Aye, my man,' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat, with a condescending smile. "'What of him?' "'If the parish would like him to learn a right pleasant trade in a good, spectable, chimbly sweeping business,' said Mr. Gamfield, "'I wants a prentice, and I am ready to take him.' 
"'Walk in,' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. Mr. Gamfield, having lingered behind to give the donkey another blow on the head, and another wrench of the jaw, as a caution not to run away in his absence, followed the gentleman with the white waistcoat into the room where Oliver had first seen him. "'It's a nasty trade,' said Mr. Limkins, when Gamfield had again stated his wish. "'Young boys have been smothered in chimneys before now,' said another gentleman. "'That's a cause. They damp the straw afore they lit it in the chimbley, to make em come down again,' said Gamfield. "'That's all smoke, and no blaze. Fear a smoke ain't a no use at all in making a boy come down, for it only sends him to sleep, and that's what he likes. Boys is very obstinate, and very lazy gentlemen, and there's nothing like a good hot blaze to make them come down with a run. It's humane, too, gentlemen, of course, even if they've stuck in the chimbley, roasting their feet makes them struggle to extricate themselves. The gentleman in the white waistcoat appeared very much amused by this explanation, but his mirth was speedily checked by a look from Mr. Limkins. The board then proceeded to converse among themselves for a few minutes, but in so low a tone, at the words, saving of expenditure, looked well in the accounts, have a printed report published, were alone audible. These only chanced to be heard, indeed, on account of their being very frequently repeated with great emphasis. At length the whispering ceased, and the members of the board, having resumed their seats and their solemnity, Mr. Limpkin said, "'We have considered your proposition, and we don't approve of it.' "'Not at all,' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. "'Decidedly not,' added the other members. As Mr. Gamfield did happen to labour under the slight imputation of having bruised three or four boys to death already, it occurred to him that the board had, perhaps in some unaccountable freak, taken it into their heads that this extraneous circumstance ought to influence their proceedings. It was very unlike their general mode of doing business, if they had, but still, as he had no particular wish to revive the rumour, he twisted his cap in his hands and walked slowly from the table. "'So you won't let me have him, gentlemen,' said Mr. Gamfield, pausing near the door. "'No,' replied Mr. Limpkins. "'At least, as it's a nasty business, we think you ought to take something less than the premium we offered.' Mr. Gamfield's countenance brightened, as, with a quick step, he returned to the table and said, "'All you give me, gentlemen, come. Don't be too hard on a poor man. What will you give? I should say three pound ten was plenty, said Mr. Limkins. Ten shillings too much, said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. Come, said Gamfield. Say four pound, gentlemen. Say four pound, and you've got rid of him for good and all. There. Three pound ten, repeated Mr. Limkins firmly. "'Come, I'll split the difference, gentlemen,' urged Gamfield. Three pound fifteen. "'Not a farthing more,' was the firm reply of Mr. Limkins. "'You're desperate hard upon me, gentlemen,' said Gamfield, wavering. "'Pooh, pooh! Nonsense!' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. "'He'd be cheap with nothing at all as a premium. Take him, you silly fellow. He's just the boy for you.' He wants the stick now and then. It'll do him good. And his board needn't come very expensive, for he hasn't been overfed since he was born. <laughs> Mr. Gamfield gave an arch look at the faces round the table, and, observing a smile on all of them, gradually broke into a smile himself. The bargain was made. Mr. Bumble was at once instructed that Oliver Twist and his indentures were to be conveyed before the magistrate for signature and approval that very afternoon. In pursuance of this determination, little Oliver, to his excessive astonishment, was released from bondage and ordered to put himself into a clean shirt. He had hardly achieved this very unusual gymnastic performance, when Mr. Bumble brought him, with his own hands, a basin of gruel and the holiday allowance of two ounces and a quarter of bread. At this tremendous sight, 
Oliver began to cry very piteously, thinking, not unnaturally, that the board must have determined to kill him for some useful purpose, or they never would have begun to fatten him up in that way. "'Don't make your eyes red, Oliver, but eat your food and be thankful,' said Mr. Bumble, in a tone of impressive pomposity. "'You're a-going to be made apprentice of, Oliver.' "'Apprentice, sir?' said the child, trembling. "'Yes, Oliver.' said Mr. Bumble. "'The kind and blessed gentleman, which is so many parents to you, Oliver, when you have none of your own, or I don't to apprentice you, and to set you up in life, and make a man of you, although the expense to the parish is three pound ten. Three pound ten, Oliver! Seventy shillings! One hundred and forty sixpences! And all for a naughty orphan, which nobody can't love!' As Mr. Bumble paused to take breath, after delivering this address in an awful voice, the tears rolled down the poor child's face, and he sobbed bitterly. "'Come,' said Mr. Bumble, somewhat less pompously, for it was gratifying to his feelings to observe the effect his eloquence had produced. "'Come, Oliver, wipe your eyes with the cuffs of your jacket, and don't cry into your gruel. That's a very foolish action, Oliver.' It certainly was for there was quite enough water in it already. On their way to the magistrate, Mr. Bumble instructed Oliver that all he would have to do would be to look very happy, and say, when the gentleman asked him if he wanted to be apprenticed, that he should like it very much indeed. Both of which injunctions Oliver promised to obey. The rather as Mr. Bumble threw in a gentle hint, that if he failed in either particular, there was no telling what would be done to him. When they arrived at the office, he was shut up in a little room by himself, and admonished by Mr. Bumble to stay there until he came back to fetch him. There the boy remained, with a palpitating heart, for half an hour, at the expiration of which time Mr. Bumble thrust in his head, unadorned with a cocked hat, and said aloud, "'Now, Oliver, my dear, come to the gentleman.' As Mr. Bumble said this, he put on a grim and threatening look and added in a low voice, "'Mind what I told you, you young rascal!' Oliver stared innocently in Mr. Bumble's face at this somewhat contradictory style of address. But that gentleman prevented his offering any remark thereupon, by leading him at once into an adjoining room, the door of which was open. It was a large room, with a great window. Behind a desk sat two old gentlemen with powdered heads, one of whom was reading the newspaper, while the other was perusing, with the aid of a pair of tortoise-shell spectacles, a small piece of parchment which lay before him. Mr. Limpkins was standing in front of the desk on one side, and Mr. Gamfield, with a partially washed face, on the other, while two or three bluff-looking men in top-boots were lounging about. The old gentleman with the spectacles gradually dozed off, over the little bit of parchment, and there was a short pause after Oliver had been stationed by Mr. Bumble in front of the desk. "'This is the boy, your worship,' said Mr. Bumble. The old gentleman, who was reading the newspaper, raised his head for a moment, and pulled the other old gentleman by the sleeve, whereupon the last-mentioned old gentleman woke up. "'Oh, is this the boy?' said the old gentleman. "'This is him, sir.' replied Mr. Bumble. "'Bow to the magistrate, my dear.' Oliver roused himself, and made his best obeisance. He had been wondering, with his eyes fixed on the magistrate's powder, whether all boards were born with that white stuff on their heads, and were boards from thenceforth on that account. "'Well,' said the old gentleman, "'I suppose he's fond of chimney-sweeping?' "'He dotes on it, your worship,' replied Bumble, giving Oliver a sly pinch to intimate that he'd better not say he didn't. "'And he will be a sweep, will he?' inquired the old gentleman. "'If we was to bind him to any other trade to-morrow, he'd run away simultaneous, your worship,' replied Bumble. "'And this man that's to be his master, you, sir, you'll treat him well, and feed him, and do all that uh, sort of thing, will you?' 
said the old gentleman. "'When I says I will, I means I will,' replied Mr. Gamfield doggedly. "'You're a rough speaker, my friend, but uh, you look an honest, uh, open-hearted man,' said the old gentleman turning his spectacles in the direction of the candidate for Oliver's premium, whose villainous countenance was a regular stamped receipt for cruelty. But the magistrate was half blind, and half childish, so he couldn't reasonably be expected to discern what other people did. "'I hope I am, sir,' said Mr. Camfield, with an ugly leer. "'I have no doubt you are, my friend.' replied the old gentleman, fixing his spectacles more firmly on his nose, and looking about him for the inkstand. It was the critical moment of Oliver's fate. If the inkstand had been where the old gentleman thought it was, he would have dipped his pen into it, and signed the indentures, and Oliver would have been straightway hurried off. But, as it chanced to be immediately under his nose, it followed, as a matter of course, that he looked all over his desk for it, without finding it, and happening in the course of his search to look straight before him, his gaze encountered the pale and terrified face of Oliver Twist, who, despite all the admonitory looks and pinches of Bumble, was regarding the repulsive countenance of his future master with a mingled expression of horror and fear, too palpable to be mistaken, even by a half-blind magistrate. The old gentleman stopped laid down his pen, and looked from Oliver to Mr. Limpkins, who attempted to take snuff with a cheerful and unconcerned aspect. "'My boy,' said the old gentleman, "'you look pale and alarmed. What is the matter?' "'Stand a little away from him, Beadle,' said the other magistrate, laying aside the paper, and leaning forward with an expression of interest. "'Now, boy, tell us what's the matter.' Don't be afraid." Oliver fell on his knees, and, clasping his hands together, prayed that they would order him back to the dark room, that they would starve him, beat him, kill him if they pleased, rather than send him away with that dreadful man. "'Well,' said Mr. Bumble, raising his hands and eyes with most impressive solemnity, "'well, of all the artful and designing orphans that ever I see. Oliver, you are one of the most barefacedest. Hold your tongue, Beadle," said the second old gentleman, when Mr. Bumble had given vent to this compound adjective. "'I beg your worship's pardon,' said Mr. Bumble, incredulous of having heard aright. "'Did your worship speak to me?' "'Yes. Hold your tongue.' Mr. Bumble was stupefied with astonishment. "'A Beadle?' ordered to hold his tongue? A moral revolution!" The old gentleman, in the tortoiseshell spectacles, looked at his companion. He nodded significantly. "'We refuse to sanction these indentures,' said the old gentleman, tossing aside the piece of parchment as he spoke. "'I hope,' stammered Mr. Limpkins, "'I hope that magistrates will not form the opinion that the authorities have been guilty of any improper conduct on the unsupported testimony of a child. The magistrates are not called upon to pronounce any opinion on the matter," said the second old gentleman sharply. Take the boy back to the workhouse, and treat him kindly. He seems to want it. That same evening, the gentleman in the white waistcoat most positively and decidedly affirmed not only that Oliver would be hung, but that he would be drawn and quartered into the bargain. Mr. Bumble shook his head with gloomy mystery, and said he wished he might come to good, whereupon Mr. Gamfield replied that he wished he might come to him, which, although he agreed with the beadle in most matters, would seem to be a wish of a totally opposite description. The next morning the public were once more informed that Oliver Twist was again to let and that five pounds would be paid to anybody who would take possession of him. CHAPTER Four OF OLIVER TWIST Oliver, being offered another place, makes his first entry into public life. In great families, when an advantageous place cannot be obtained, 
either in possession, reversion, remainder, or expectancy, for the young man who is growing up. It is a very general custom to send him to sea. The board, in imitation of so wise and salutary an example, took counsel together on the expediency of shipping off Oliver Twist, in some small trading vessel bound to a good unhealthy port. This suggested itself as the very best thing that could possibly be done with him. The probability being that the skipper would flog him to death, in a playful mood, some day after dinner, or would knock his brains out with an iron bar both pastimes being, as is pretty generally known, very favourite and common recreations among gentlemen of that class. The more the case presented itself to the board, in this point of view, the more manifold the advantages of the step appeared. So they came to the conclusion that the only way of providing for Oliver effectually was to send him to sea without delay. Mr. Bumble had been dispatched to make various preliminary inquiries with the view of finding out some captain or other who wanted a cabin-boy without any friends, and was returning to the workhouse to communicate the result of his mission, when he encountered at the gate no less a person than Mr. Sowerberry, the parochial undertaker. Mr. Sowerberry was a tall, gaunt, large-jointed man, attired in a suit of threadbare black, with darned cotton stockings of the same colour, and shoes to answer. His features were not naturally intended to wear a smiling aspect, but he was in general rather given to professional jocosity. His step was elastic, and his face betokened inward pleasantry, as he advanced to Mr. Bumble, and shook him cordially by the hand. "'I have taken the measure of the two women that died last night, Mr. Bumble,' said the undertaker. "'You make your fortune, Mr. Sowerberry,' said the beadle as he thrust his thumb and forefinger into the proffered snuff-box of the undertaker, which was an ingenious little model of a patent coffin. "'I say, you make your fortune, Mr. Sowerberry,' repeated Mr. Bumble, tapping the undertaker on the shoulder in a friendly manner with his cane. "'Think so?' said the undertaker, in a tone which half admitted and half disputed the probability of the event. The price is allowed by the board a very small, Mr. Bumble. So are the coffins, replied the beadle, with precisely as near an approach to a laugh as a great official ought to indulge in. Mr. Sowerberry was much tickled at this, as of course he ought to be, and laughed a long time without cessation. Well, well, Mr. Bumble, he said at length, there's no denying that, since the new system of feeding has come in, the coffins are something narrower and more shallow than they used to be, but we must have some profit, Mr. Bumble. Well-seasoned timber is an expensive article, sir, and all the iron handles come by canal from Birmingham. Well, well, said Mr. Bumble, every trade has its drawback. A fair profit is, of course, allowable. Of course, of course, replied the undertaker. And if I don't get a profit upon this or that particular article, why, I make it up in the long run, you see? <laughs> Just so, said Mr. Bumble. Though I must say, continued the undertaker, resuming the current of observations which the beadle had interrupted. "'Though I must say, Mr. Bumble, that I have to contend against one very great disadvantage, which is that all the stout people go off the quickest. The people who have been better off, and have paid rates for many years, are the first to sink when they come into the house. And let me tell you, Mr. Bumble, that three or four inches over one's calculation makes a great hole in one's profits especially when one has a family to provide for, sir." As Mr. Sowerbury said this, with the becoming indignation of an ill-used man, and as Mr. Bumble felt that it rather tended to convey a reflection on the honour of the parish, the latter gentleman thought it advisable to change the subject. Oliver Twist being uppermost in his mind, he made him his theme. "'By the by,' said Mr. Bumble. You don't know anybody who wants a boy, do you? A parochial prentice, who is at present a dead weight, 
a millstone, as I may say, round the parochial throat. "'Liberal terms, Mr. Sowerberry, liberal terms.' As Mr. Bumble spoke, he raised his cane to the bill above him, and gave three distinct raps upon the words, Five Pounds, which were printed thereon in Roman capitals of gigantic size. "'Gods, oh!' said the undertaker, taking Mr. Bumble by the gilt-edged lapel of his official coat. "'That's just the very thing I wanted to speak to you about. You know, dear me, what a very elegant button this is, Mr. Bumble. I never noticed it before.' "'Yes, I think it rather pretty,' said the beadle, glancing proudly downwards at the large brass buttons which embellished his coat. "'The die is the same as the parochial seal, the good Samaritan healing the sick and bruised man. The board presented it to me on New Year's morning, Mr. Sowerberry. I put it on, I remember, for the first time, to attend the inquest on that reduced tradesman who died in a doorway at midnight. "'I recollect,' said the undertaker, "'the jury brought it in, died from exposure to the cold and want of the common necessaries of life, didn't they?' Mr. Bumble nodded. "'And they made it a special verdict, I think.' said the undertaker, by adding some words to the effect, that if the relieving officer had— "'Tush! Foolery!' interposed the beadle. "'If the board attended to all the nonsense that ignorant jurymen talk, they'd have enough to do.' "'Very true,' said the undertaker. "'They would, indeed.' "'Juries,' said Mr. Bumble, grasping his cane tightly, as was his wont when working into a passion. Juries is inadequated, vulgar, grovelling wretches. So they are, said the undertaker. They haven't no more philosophy nor political economy about them than that, said the beadle, snapping his fingers contemptuously. No more they have, acquiesced the undertaker. I despise em, said the beadle, growing very red in the face. So do I, rejoined the undertaker. "'And I only wish we'd a jury of the independent sort in the house for a week or two, said the beadle. "'The rules and regulations of the board would soon bring their spirit down for him. "'Let them alone for that,' replied the undertaker. So saying, he smiled approvingly, to calm the rising wrath of the indignant parish officer. Mr. Bumble lifted off his cocked hat, took a handkerchief from the inside of the crown, wiped from his forehead the perspiration which his rage had engendered, fixed the cocked hat on again, and, turning to the undertaker, said in a calmer voice, "'Well, what about the boy?' "'Oh,' replied the undertaker, "'why, you know, Mr. Bumble, I pay a good deal towards the poor's rates.' "'Ahem,' <clears throat> said Mr. Bumble. "'Well?' "'Well,' replied the undertaker, "'I was thinking that if I pay so much towards him, I've a right to get as much out of him as I can, Mr. Bumble, and so I think I'll take the boy myself.' Mr. Bumble grasped the undertaker by the arm, and led him into the building. Mr. Sowerberry was closeted with the board for five minutes, and it was arranged that Oliver should go to him that evening upon liking, a phrase which means in the case of a parish apprentice that if the master find, upon a short trial, that he can get enough work out of a boy without putting too much food into him, he shall have him for a term of years to do what he likes with. When little Oliver was taken before the gentleman that evening, and informed that he was to go that night as general house lad to a coffin maker's, and that if he complained of his situation, or ever came back to the parish again, he would be sent to sea, there to be drowned, or knocked on the head, as the case might be. He evinced so little emotion, that they by common consent pronounced him a hardened young rascal, and ordered Mr. Bumble to remove him forthwith. Now, although it was very natural that the board, of all people in the world, should feel in a great state of virtuous astonishment and horror, at the smallest tokens of want of feeling on the part of anybody, they were rather out in this particular instance. The simple fact was, that Oliver, instead of possessing too little feeling, 
possessed rather too much, and was in a fair way of being reduced for life to a state of brutal stupidity and sullenness by the ill-usage he had received. He heard the news of his destination in perfect silence, and having had his luggage put into his hand, which was not very difficult to carry, inasmuch as it was all comprised within the limits of a brown paper parcel, about half a foot square by three inches deep. He pulled his cap over his eyes, and once more attaching himself to Mr. Bumble's coat-cuff, was led away by that dignitary to a new scene of suffering. For some time Mr. Bumble drew Oliver along, without notice or remark, for the beadle carried his head very erect, as a beadle always should, and, it being a windy day, little Oliver was completely enshrouded by the skirts of Mr. Bumble's coat as they blew open, and disclosed to great advantage his flapped waistcoat and drab plush knee-breeches. As they drew near to their destination, however, Mr. Bumble thought it expedient to look down, and see that the boy was in good order for inspection by his new master, which he accordingly did, with a fit and becoming air of gracious patronage. Oliver, said Mr. Bumble. "'Yes, sir,' replied Oliver, in a low, tremulous voice. "'Pull that cap off your eyes, and hold up your head, sir.' Although Oliver did as he was desired at once, and passed the back of his unoccupied hand briskly across his eyes, he left a tear in them when they looked up at his conductor. As Mr. Bumble gazed sternly upon him, it rolled down his cheek. It was followed by another, and another. The child made a strong effort, but it was an unsuccessful one. Withdrawing his other hand from Mr. Bumble's, he covered his face with both, and wept until the tears sprung out from between his chin and bony fingers. "'Well!' exclaimed Mr. Bumble, stopping short, and darting at his little charge a look of intense malignity. "'Well! Of all the ungratefulest and worst disposed boys as ever I see, Oliver, you are the—' "'No, no, sir,' sobbed Oliver, clinging to the hand which held the well-known cane. "'No, no, sir. I will be good indeed. Indeed, indeed, I will, sir. I am a very little boy, sir, and it is so—so—' "'So what?' inquired Mr. Bumble, in amazement. "'So lonely, sir, so very lonely,' cried the child. "'Everybody hates me. Oh, sir, don't, don't pray be cross to me.' The child beat his hand upon his heart, and looked in his companion's face with tears of real agony. Mr. Bumble regarded Oliver's piteous and helpless look with some astonishment for a few seconds, hemmed three or four times in a husky manner, and after muttering something about that troublesome cough, bade Oliver dry his eyes and be a good boy. And once more, taking his hand, he walked on with him in silence. The undertaker, who had just put up the shutters of his shop, was making some entries in his day-book by the light of a most appropriate dismal candle, when Mr. Bumble entered. "'Ah, uh-huh. ah!' said the undertaker, looking up from the book, and pausing in the middle of a word. "'Is that you, Bumble?' "'No one else, Mr. Sowberry,' replied the beadle. "'Here, I brought the boy.' Oliver made a bow. "'Oh, that's the boy, is it?' said the undertaker, raising the candle above his head to get a better view of Oliver. "'Mrs. Sowerberry, will you have the goodness to come here a moment?' "'My dear?' Mrs. Sowerberry emerged from a little room behind the shop, and presented the form of a short, then squeezed-up woman, with a vixenish countenance. "'My dear,' said Mr. Sowerberry, deferentially, "'this is the boy from the workhouse that I told you of.' Oliver bowed again. "'Dear me,' said the undertaker's wife, "'he's very small.' "'Why?' "'He is uh, rather small,' replied Mr. Bumble, looking at Oliver, as if it were his fault that he was no bigger. "'He is small. There's no denying it. But he'll grow, Mrs. Arbery. He'll grow.' "'Ah! I dare say he will,' replied the lady pettishly, "'on our victuals and our drink.' 
I'll see no saving in parish children, not I, for they always cost more to keep than they're worth. However, men always think they know best. There, get downstairs, little bag of bones. With this, the undertaker's wife opened a side door, and pushed Oliver down a steep flight of stairs into a stone cell, damp and dark, forming the ante-room to the coal-cellar, and denominated kitchen, wherein sat a slatternly girl, in shoes down at heel, and blue worsted stockings very much out of repair. "'Here, Charlotte,' said Mr. Sowerberry, who had followed Oliver down, "'give this boy some of the cold bits that were put by for trip. He hasn't come home since the morning, so he may go out without him. I dare say the boy isn't too dainty to eat him, are you, boy?' Oliver, whose eyes had glistened at the mention of meat, and who was trembling with eagerness to devour it, replied in the negative, and a plateful of coarse, broken victuals was set before him. I wish some well-fed philosopher, whose meat and drink turn to gall within him, whose blood is ice, whose heart is iron, could have seen Oliver twist, clutching at the dainty viands that the dog had neglected. I wish he could have witnessed the horrible avidity with which Oliver tore the bits asunder with all the ferocity of famine. There is only one thing I should like better, and that would be to see the philosopher making the same sort of meal himself, with the same relish." "'Well,' said the undertaker's wife, when Oliver had finished his supper, which she had regarded in silent horror, and with fearful auguries of his future appetite, "'have you done?' There being nothing eatable within his reach, Oliver replied in the affirmative. "'Then come with me,' said Mrs. Sowerberry, taking up a dim and dirty lamp, and leading the way upstairs. "'Your bed's under the counter. You don't mind slipping among the coffins, I suppose. But it doesn't much matter whether you do or don't, for you can't sleep anywhere else. Come, don't keep me here all night.' Oliver lingered no longer, but meekly followed his new mistress. Chapter Five of Oliver Twist Oliver mingles with new associates. Going to a funeral for the first time, he forms an unfavourable notion of his master's business. Oliver, being left to himself in the undertaker's shop, set the lamp down on a workman's bench, and gazed timidly about him with a feeling of awe and dread, which many people a good deal older than he will be at no loss to understand. An unfinished coffin on black trestles, which stood in the middle of the shop, looked so gloomy and death-like that a cold tremble came over him every time his eyes wandered in the direction of the dismal object, from which he almost expected to see some frightful form slowly rear its head to drive him mad with terror. Against the wall were ranged in regular array a long row of elm boards cut in the same shape, looking in the dim light like high-shouldered ghosts with their hands in their breeches' pockets. Coffin-plates, elm-chips, bright-headed nails, and shreds of black cloth lay scattered on the floor, and the wall behind the counter was ornamented with a lively representation of two mutes in very stiff neckcloths, on duty at a large private door, with a hearse drawn by four black steeds approaching in the distance. The shop was close and hot. The atmosphere seemed tainted with the smell of coffins. The recess beneath the counter in which his flock mattress was thrust looked like a grave. Nor were these the only dismal feelings which depressed Oliver. He was alone in a strange place, and we all know how chilled and desolate the best of us will sometimes feel in such a situation. The boy had no friends to care for, or to care for him. The regret of no recent separation was fresh in his mind. The absence of no loved and well-remembered face sank heavily into his heart. But his heart was heavy notwithstanding and he wished, as he crept into his narrow bed, that that were his coffin, and that he could be lain in a calm and lasting sleep in the churchyard ground, with the tall grass waving gently above his head, and the sound of the old deep bell to soothe him in his sleep. Oliver was awakened in the morning by a loud kicking at the outside of the shop door, which, before he could huddle on his clothes, was repeated in an angry and impetuous manner about twenty-five times. When he began to undo the chain, the legs desisted, 
and a voice began. "'Open the door, will you?' cried the voice, which belonged to the legs which had kicked at the door. "'I will, directly, sir,' replied Oliver, undoing the chain and turning the key. "'I suppose you're the new boy, ain't you?' said the voice through the keyhole. "'Yes, sir,' replied Oliver. "'How old are you?' inquired the voice. Ten, sir,' replied Oliver. "'Then I'll whop you when I get in,' said the voice. "'You just see if I don't. That's all my workers, brat.' And having made this obliging promise, the voice began to whistle. Oliver had been too often subjected to the process to which the very expressive monosyllable, just recorded, bears reference, to entertain the smallest doubt that the owner of the voice, whoever he might be, would redeem his pledge most honourably. He drew back the bolts with a trembling hand, and opened the door. For a second or two, Oliver glanced up the street, and down the street, and over the way, impressed with the belief that the unknown, who had addressed him through the keyhole, had walked a few paces off to warm himself, for nobody did he see but a big charity boy, sitting on a post in front of the house, eating a slice of bread and butter, which he cut into wedges the size of his mouth, with a clasp-knife, and then consumed with great dexterity. "'I beg your pardon, sir,' said Oliver at length, seeing that no other visitor made his appearance. "'Did you knock?' "'I kicked,' replied the charity boy. "'Did you want a coffin, sir?' inquired Oliver innocently. At this, the charity boy looked monstrous fierce, and said that Oliver would want one before long if he cut jokes with his superiors in that way. "'You don't know who I am, I suppose, workers,' said the charity boy, in continuation, descending from the top of the post, meanwhile, with edifying gravity. "'No, sir,' rejoined Oliver. "'I'm Mr. Noah Claypole,' said the charity boy, "'and you're under me. Take down the shutters, you idle young ruffian.' With this, Mr. Claypole administered a kick to Oliver, and entered the shop with a dignified air, which did him great credit. It is difficult for a large-headed, small-eyed youth, of lumbering make and heavy countenance, to look dignified under any circumstances, but it is more especially so, when superadded to these personal attractions are a red nose and yellow smalls. Oliver, having taken down the shutters, and broken a pane of glass in his effort to stagger away beneath the weight of the first one, to a small court at the side of the house, in which they were kept during the day, was graciously assisted by Noah, who, having consoled him with the assurance that he'd catch it, condescended to help him. Mr. Sowerberry came down soon after. Shortly afterwards, Mrs. Sowerberry appeared. Oliver, having caught it, in fulfilment of Noah's prediction, followed that young gentleman down the stairs to breakfast. "'Come near the fire, Noah,' said Charlotte. "'I saved a nice little bit of bacon for you from Master's breakfast. "'Oliver, shut that door at Mr. Noah's back, "'and take them bits that I put out on the cover of the bread-pan. "'Here's your tea. "'Take it away to that box, and drink it there, "'and make haste, for they want you to mind the shop. "'Do you hear?' "'Dear workers,' said Noah Claypole. "'Law, Noah,' said Charlotte, what a rum creature you are! Why don't you let the boy alone?" "'Let him alone?' said Noah. "'Why, everybody lets him alone enough for the matter of that. Neither his father nor his mother will ever interfere with him. All his relations let him have his own way pretty well, eh, Charlotte? Hee <laughs> hee you queer soul!' said Charlotte, bursting into a hearty laugh in which she was joined by Noah, after which they both looked scornfully at poor Oliver Twist as he sat shivering on the box in the coldest corner of the room, and ate the stale pieces which had been specially reserved for him. Noah was a charity boy, but not a workhouse orphan. No chance child was he, for he could trace his genealogy all the way back to his parents, who lived hard by. His mother being a washerwoman, and his father a drunken soldier, discharged with the wooden leg, and a diurnal pension of tuppence halfpenny and an unstateable fraction. The shop-boys in the neighbourhood had long been in the habit of branding Noah in the public streets, with the ignominious epithets of Leathers, Charity, and the like, 
and Noah had borne them without reply. But, now that fortune had cast in his way a nameless orphan, at whom even the meanest could point the finger of scorn, he retorted on him with interest. This affords charming food for contemplation. It shows us what a beautiful thing human nature may be made to be, and how impartially the same amiable qualities are developed in the finest lord and the dirtiest charity boy. Oliver had been sojourning at the undertaker's some three weeks or a month. Mr. and Mrs. Sowerberry, the shop being shut up, were taking their supper in the little back parlour, when Mr. Sowerberry, after several deferential glances at his wife, said, "'My dear!' He was going to say more, but Mrs. Sowerberry, looking up with a peculiarly unpropitious aspect, he stopped short. "'Well?' said Mrs. Sowerberry sharply. "'Nothing, uh, my dear, nothing,' said Mr. Sowerberry. Oh, "'You brute!' said Mrs. Sowerberry. "'Not at all, my dear,' said Mr. Sowerberry humbly. "'I thought you didn't want to hear, my dear. I was only going to say—' "'Oh, don't tell me what you were going to say,' interposed Mrs. Sowerberry. "'I'm nobody. Don't consult me, pray. I don't want to intrude upon your secrets.' As Mrs. Sowerberry said this, she gave an hysterical laugh, which threatened violent consequences. "'But, my dear,' said Sowerberry, "'I want to ask your advice.' "'No, no! Oh, don't ask mine!' replied Mrs. Sowerberry, in an affecting manner. "'Ask somebody else's!' Here there was another hysterical laugh, which frightened Mr. Sowerberry very much. This is a very common and much-approved matrimonial course of treatment, which is often very effective. It had once reduced Mr. Sowerberry to begging, as a special favour, to be allowed to say what Mrs. Sowerberry was most curious to hear. After short duration, the permission was most graciously conceded. "'It's only about young Twist, my dear,' said Mr. Sowerberry. "'A very good-looking boy, that, my dear.' "'He need be, for he eats enough,' observed the lady. "'There's an expression of melancholy in his face, my dear,' resumed Mr. Sowerberry, "'which is very interesting. He would make a delightful mute, my love.' Mrs. Sowerberry looked up with an expression of considerable wonderment. Mr. Sowerberry remarked it, and, without allowing time for any observation on the good lady's part, proceeded. "'I don't mean a regular mute to attend grown-up people, my dear, but only for children's practice. It would be very new to have a mute in proportion, my dear. You may depend upon it. It would have a superb effect.' Mrs. Sowerberry, who had a good deal of taste in the undertaking way, was much struck by the novelty of this idea. But as it would have been compromising her dignity to have said so, under existing circumstances, she merely inquired, with much sharpness, why such an obvious suggestion had not presented itself to her husband's mind before. Mr. Sowerberry rightly construed this as an acquiescence in his proposition. It was speedily determined, therefore, that Oliver should be at once initiated into the mysteries of the trade, and, with this view, that he should accompany his master on the very next occasion of his services being required. The occasion was not long in coming. Half an hour after breakfast next morning, Mr. Bumble entered the shop, and, supporting his cane against the counter, drew forth his large leathern pocket-book, from which he selected a small scrap of paper, which he handed over to Sowerberry. "'Aha!" said the undertaker, glancing over it with a lively countenance. An order for a coffin, eh? For a coffin first, and a parochial funeral afterwards," replied Mr. Bumble, fastening the strap of the leathern pocket-book, which, like himself, was very corpulent. "'Baton,' said the undertaker, looking from the scrap of paper to Mr. Bumble. "'I never heard the name before.' Bumble shook his head as he replied, "'Obstinate people, Mr. Sowerberry, very obstinate.' "'Proud, too, I'm afraid, sir.' "'Proud, eh?' exclaimed Mr. Sowerberry, with a sneer. "'Come, that's too much.' "'Oh, it's sickening,' 
replied the beadle. "'Antimonial, Mr. Sowerberry.' "'So it is,' acquiesced the undertaker. "'We only heard of the family the night before last,' said the beadle, "'and we shouldn't have known anything about them. Then, only a woman who lodges in the same house, made an application to the parochial committee for them to send the parochial surgeon to see a woman as was very bad. He had gone out to dinner, but his prentice, which is a very clever lad, sent them some medicine in a blacking bottle, off-hand. "'Ah, oh, there's promptness,' said the undertaker. "'Promptness, indeed,' replied the beadle. "'But what's the consequence? What's the ungrateful behaviour of these rebels, sir? Why, the husband sends back word that the medicine won't suit his wife's complaint, and so she shan't take it. Says she shan't take it, sir. Good, strong, wholesome medicine, as was given with great success to two Irish labourers and a coal heaver only a week before. Sent him for nothing, with a blacking bottle in, and he sent back word that she shan't take it, sir. As the atrocity presented itself to Mr. Bumble's mind in full force, he struck the counter sharply with his cane, and became flushed with indignation. "'Well,' said the undertaker, "'I never did.' "'Never did, sir,' ejaculated the beadle. "'No, nor nobody never did. But now she's dead. We've got a barrier, and that's the direction, and the sooner it's done, the better.' Thus saying, Mr. Bumble put on his cocked hat, wrong side first, in a fever of parochial excitement, and flounced out of the shop. "'Why, he was so angry, Oliver, that he forgot even to ask after you,' said Mr. Sowerberry, looking after the beadle as he strode down the street. "'Yes, sir,' replied Oliver, who had carefully kept himself out of sight during the interview and who was shaking from head to foot at the mere recollection of the sound of Mr. Bumble's voice. He needn't have taken the trouble to shrink from Mr. Bumble's glance, however, for that functionary, on whom the prediction of the gentleman in the white waistcoat had made a very strong impression, thought that now the undertaker had got Oliver upon trial, the subject was better avoided, until such time as he should be firmly bound for seven years, and all danger of his being returned upon the hands of the parish should be thus effectually and legally overcome. "'Well,' said Mr. Sowerberry, taking up his hat, "'the sooner this job is done, the better. Noah, look after the shop. Oliver, put on your cap and come with me.' Oliver obeyed, and followed his master on his professional mission. They walked on for some time, through the most crowded and densely inhabited part of the town, and then, striking down a narrow street more dirty and miserable than any they had passed through, paused to look for the house which was the object of their search. The houses on either side were high and large, but very old, and tenanted by people of the poorest class, as their neglected appearance would have sufficiently denoted without the concurrent testimony afforded by the squalid looks of the few men and women who, with folded arms and bodies half-doubled, occasionally skulked along. A great many of the tenements had shop-fronts, but these were fast closed, and mouldering away, only the upper rooms being inhabited. Some houses, which had become insecure from age and decay, were prevented from falling into the street by huge beams of wood reared against the walls and firmly planted in the road. But even these crazy dens seem to have been selected as the nightly haunts of some houseless wretches, for many of the rough boards which supplied the place of door and window were wrenched from their positions, to afford an aperture wide enough for the passage of a human body. The kennel was stagnant and filthy. The very rats, which here and there lay putrefying in its rottenness, were hideous with famine. There was neither knocker nor bell-handle at the open door, where Oliver and his master stopped. So, groping his way cautiously through the dark passage, and bidding Oliver keep close to him and not to be afraid, the undertaker mounted to the top of the first flight of stairs. Stumbling against the door on the landing, he rapped at it with his knuckles. It was opened by a young girl of thirteen or fourteen. The undertaker at once saw enough of what the room contained to know it was the apartment to which he had been directed. He stepped in, 
Oliver followed him. There was no fire in the room, but a man was crouching mechanically over the empty stove. An old woman, too, had drawn a low stool to the cold hearth, and was sitting beside him. There were some ragged children in another corner, and in a small recess opposite the door there lay upon the ground something covered with an old blanket. Oliver shuddered as he cast his eyes toward the place, and crept involuntarily closer to his master, for though it was covered up, the boy felt that it was a corpse. The man's face was thin and very pale, his hair and beard were grisly, his eyes were bloodshot. The old woman's face was wrinkled, her two remaining teeth protruded over her under-lip, and her eyes were bright and piercing. Oliver was afraid to look at either her or the man. They seemed so like the rats he had seen outside. "'Nobody shall go near her,' said the man, starting fiercely up as the undertaker approached the recess. "'Keep back! Damn you! Keep back, if you've a life to lose!' "'Nonsense, my good man,' said the undertaker, who was pretty well used to misery in all its shapes. "'Nonsense! I tell you,' said the man, clenching his hands and stamping furiously on the floor, "'I tell you, I won't have her put into the ground. She couldn't rest there. The worms would worry her, and not eat her. She's so worn away.' The undertaker offered no reply to this raving, but producing a tape from his pocket, knelt down for a moment by the side of the body. "'Ah!' Oh, said the man bursting into tears and sinking on his knees at the feet of the dead woman. "'Kneel down! Kneel down! Kneel round her, every one of you! And mark my words, I say she was starved to death! I never knew how bad she was, till the fever came upon her, and then her bones were starting through the skin. There was neither fire nor candle. She died in the dark, in the dark!' She couldn't even see her children's faces, though we heard her gasping out their names. I begged for her in the streets. They sent me to prison. When I came back, she was dying, and all the blood in my heart has dried up, for they starved her to death. I swear it before the God that saw it. They starved her. He twined his hands in his hair and, with a loud scream, rolled grovelling upon the floor, his eyes fixed, and the foam covering his lips. The terrified children cried bitterly. But the old woman, who had hitherto remained as quiet as if she had been wholly deaf to all that passed, menaced them into silence. Having unloosened the cravat of the man who still remained extended on the ground, she tottered towards the undertaker. "'She was my daughter,' said the old woman, nodding her head in the direction of the corpse, and speaking with an idiotic leer, more ghastly than even the presence of death in such a place. "'Lord, Lord, well, it is strange that I, who gave birth to her, and was a woman then, should be alive and merry now, <laughs> and she lying there, so cold and stiff. Lord, Lord, to think of it, it's as good as a play, as good as a play." As the wretched creature mumbled and chuckled in her hideous merriment, the undertaker turned to go away. Stop. Stop! said the old woman in a loud whisper. Will she be buried to morrow or next day or to night? I laid her out, and I must walk, you know. Send me a large cloak, a good warm one, for it is bitter cold. We should have cake and wine, too, before we go. Never mind. Send some bread, only a loaf of bread, and a cup of water. And shall we have some bread, dear?" she said eagerly, catching at the undertaker's coat, as he once more moved towards the door. "'Yes, yes,' said the undertaker. "'Of course. Anything you like.' He disengaged himself from the old woman's grasp, and, drawing Oliver after him, hurried away. 
The next day, the family having been meanwhile relieved with a half-quartern loaf and a piece of cheese left with them by Mr. Bumble himself, Oliver and his master returned to the miserable abode, where Mr. Bumble had already arrived, accompanied by four men from the workhouse, who were to act as bearers. An old black cloak had been thrown over the rags of the old woman and the man, and the bare coffin having been screwed down, was hoisted on the shoulders of the bearers, and carried into the street. "'Now you must put your best leg foremost, old lady,' whispered Sowerberry in the old woman's ear. "'We're rather late, and it won't do to keep the clergyman waiting. Move on, my men, as quick as you like.' Thus directed, the bearers trotted on under their light burden, and the two mourners kept as near them as they could. Mr. Bumble and Sowerberry walked at a good smart pace in front, and Oliver, whose legs were not so long as his master's, ran by the side. There was not so great a necessity for hurrying, as Mr. Sowerberry had anticipated, however, for when they reached the obscure corner of the churchyard in which the nettles grew, and where the parish graves were made, the clergyman had not arrived, and the clerk, who was sitting by the vestry-room fire, seemed to think it by no means improbable that it might be an hour or so before he came. So they put the beer on the brink of the grave, and the two mourners waited patiently in the damp clay, with a cold rain drizzling down, while the ragged boys whom the spectacle had attracted into the churchyard played a noisy game at hide-and-seek among the tombstones, or varied their amusements by jumping backwards and forwards over the coffin. Mr. Sowerberry and Mr. Bumble, being personal friends of the clerk, sat by the fire with him, and read the paper. At length, after a lapse of something more than an hour, Mr. Bumble, and Sowerberry, and the clerk, were seen running towards the grave. Immediately afterwards, the clergyman appeared, putting on his surplice as he came along. Mr. Bumble then thrashed a boy or two, to keep up appearances, and the reverend gentleman, having read as much of the burial service as could be compressed into four minutes, gave his surplice to the clerk, and walked away again. "'Now, Bill,' said Sowerberry to the grave-digger, "'fill up.' It was no very difficult task, for the grave was so full that the uppermost coffin was within a few feet of the surface. The grave-digger shovelled in the earth, stamped it loosely down with his feet, shouldered his spade, and walked off, followed by the boys, who murmured very loud complaints at the fun being over so soon. "'Come, my good fellow,' said Bumble tapping the man on the back. They want to shut up the yard." The man, who had never once moved, since he had taken his station by the graveside, started, raised his head, stared at the person who had addressed him, walked forward for a few paces, and fell down in a swoon. The crazy old woman was too much occupied in bewailing the loss of her cloak, which the undertaker had taken off, to pay him any attention. So they threw a can of cold water over him and when he came to, saw him safely out of the churchyard, locked the gate, and departed on their different ways. "'Well, Oliver,' said Sowerberry, as they walked home, "'how do you like it?' "'Pretty well, thank you, sir,' replied Oliver, with considerable hesitation. "'Not very much, sir.' "'Ah, you'll get used to it in time, Oliver,' said Sowerberry. "'Nothing—' when you are used to it, my boy." Oliver wondered, in his own mind, whether it had taken a very long time to get Mr. Sowerberry used to it, but he thought it better not to ask a question, and walked back to the shop, thinking over all he had seen and heard. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens Chapter 6 Oliver, being goaded by the taunts of Noah, rouses into action and rather astonishes him. The month's trial over, Oliver was formally apprenticed. It was a nice, sickly season, just at this time. In commercial phrase, coffins were looking up, and in the course of a few weeks Oliver acquired a great deal of experience. The success of Mr. Sowerberry's ingenious speculation exceeded even his most sanguine hopes. The oldest inhabitants recollect no period at which measles had been so prevalent, or so fatal to infant existence, and many were the mournful processions which little Oliver headed, in a hat-band reaching down to his knees, 
to the indescribable admiration and emotion of all the mothers in the town. As Oliver accompanied his master in most of his adult expeditions, too, in order that he might acquire that equanimity of demeanour, and full command of nerve, which was essential to a finished undertaker, he had many opportunities of observing the beautiful resignation and fortitude with which some strong-minded people bear their trials and losses. For instance, when Sowerberry had an order for the burial of some rich old lady or gentleman, who was surrounded by a great number of nephews and nieces, who had been perfectly inconsolable during the previous illness, and whose grief had been wholly irrepressible even on the most public occasions, they would be as happy among themselves as need be, quite cheerful and contented, conversing together with as much freedom and gaiety as if nothing whatever had happened to disturb them. Husbands, too, bore the loss of their wives with the most heroic calmness. Wives, again, put on weeds for their husbands, as if, so far from grieving in the garb of sorrow, they had made up their minds to render it as becoming and attractive as possible. It was observable, too, that ladies and gentlemen who were in passions of anguish during the ceremony of interment, recovered almost as soon as they reached home, and became quite composed before the tea-drinking was over. All this was very pleasant and improving to see, and Oliver beheld it with great admiration. That Oliver Twist was moved to resignation, by the example of these good people, I cannot, although I am his biographer, undertake to affirm with any degree of confidence, but I can most distinctly say that for many months he continued meekly to submit to the domination and ill-treatment of Noah Claypole, who used him far worse than before, now that his jealousy was roused, by seeing the new boy promoted to the black stick and hat-band, while he, the old one, remained stationary in the muffin-cap and leathers. Charlotte treated him ill, because Noah did, and Mr. Sowerberry was his decided enemy, because Mr. Sowerberry was disposed to be his friend. So between these three on one side, and a glut of funerals on the other, Oliver was not altogether as comfortable as the hungry pig was, when he was shut up by mistake in the grain department of a brewery. And now I come to a very important passage in Oliver's history, for I have to record an act, slight and unimportant perhaps in appearance, but which indirectly produced a material change in all his future prospects and proceedings. One day Oliver and Noah had descended into the kitchen at the usual dinner-hour, to banquet upon a small joint of mutton, a pound and a half of the worst end of the neck. When Charlotte, being called out of the way, there ensued a brief interval of time which Noah Claypole, being hungry and vicious, considered he could not possibly devote to a worthier purpose than aggravating and tantalizing young Oliver Twist. Intent upon this innocent amusement, Noah put his feet on the tablecloth, and pulled Oliver's hair, and twitched his ears, and expressed his opinion that he was a sneak, and furthermore announced his intention of coming to see him hanged, whenever that desirable event should take place, and entered upon various topics of petty annoyance, like a malicious and ill-conditioned charity boy as he was. But, making Oliver cry, Noah attempted to be more facetious still, and in his attempt did what many sometimes do to this day, when they want to be funny, he got rather personal. "'Workus,' said Noah, "'how's your mother?' "'She's dead.' replied Oliver. "'Don't you say anything about her to me?' Oliver's colour rose as he said this. He breathed quickly, and there was a curious working of the mouth and nostrils, which Mr. Claypole thought must be the immediate precursor of a violent fit of crying. Under this impression he returned to the charge. "'What did she die of, workers?' said Noah. "'Of a broken heart. Some of our old nurses told me.' replied Oliver, more as if he were talking to himself than answering Noah. "'I think I know what it must be to die of that.' "'Told ye roll all all right for Larry, workers,' said Noah, as a tear rolled down Oliver's cheek. "'What set you a snivelling now?' "'Not you,' replied Oliver sharply. "'There, that's enough. Don't say anything more to me about her.' "'You better not.' "'Better not!' exclaimed Noah, 
"'Well, better not work us, don't be impudent. Your mother, too. She was a nice and she was. Oh, Lor!' And here Noah nodded his head expressively, and curled up as much of his small red nose as muscular action could collect together for the occasion. "'You know, workers,' continued Noah, emboldened by Oliver's silence, and speaking in a jeering tone of affected pity, of all tones the most annoying, "'You know, workers, it can't be helped now, and of course you couldn't help it then, and I'm very sorry for it, and I'm sure we all are, and pity you very much. But you must know, workers, your mother was a regular right down bad un. "'What did you say?' inquired Oliver, looking up very quickly. "'A regular right down bad un, workers,' replied Noah coolly. "'And it's a great deal better, workers, as she died when she did, or else she'd have been hard labouring in Bridewell, or transported, or hung, which is more likely than either, isn't it?' Crimson with fury, Oliver started up, overthrew the chair and table, seized Noah by the throat, shook him in the violence of his rage, till his teeth chattered in his head, and collecting his whole force into one heavy blow, felled him to the ground. A minute ago the boy had looked the quiet child, mild, dejected creature that harsh treatment had made him, but his spirit was roused at last. The cruel insult to his dead mother had set his blood on fire. His breast heaved, his attitude was erect, his eyes bright and vivid, his whole person changed, as he stood glaring over the cowardly tormentor who now lay crouching at his feet, and defied him with an energy he had never known before. "'You murder me!' blubbered Noah. "'Charlotte! Mrs! Is the new boy a virgin of me? Help! Help!' "'Oliver's gone bad! Charlotte!' Noah's shouts were responded to by a loud scream from Charlotte, and a louder one from Mrs. Sowerberry, the former of whom rushed into the kitchen by a side door, while the latter paused on the staircase till she was quite certain that it was consistent with the preservation of human life to come further down. "'Oh, you little wretch!' screamed Charlotte, seizing Oliver with her utmost force which was about equal to that of a moderately strong man, in particularly good training. "'Oh, you little ungrateful, murderous, horrid villain!' And between every syllable, Charlotte gave Oliver a blow with all her might, accompanying it with a scream for the benefit of society. Charlotte's fist was by no means a light one, but, lest it should not be effectual in calming Oliver's wrath, Mrs. Sowerberry plunged into the kitchen and assisted to hold him with one hand, while she scratched his face with the other. In this favourable position of affairs, Noah rose from the ground and pommelled him behind. This was rather too violent exercise to last long. When they were all wearied out, and could tear and beat no longer, they dragged Oliver, struggling and shouting, but nothing daunted, into the dust-cellar, and there locked him up. This being done, Mrs. Sowerberry sunk into a chair, and burst into tears. "'Bless her! She's going off!' said Charlotte. "'A glass of water, Noah, dear. Make haste!' "'Oh, Charlotte!' said Mrs. Sowerberry, speaking as well as she could, through a deficiency of breath, and a sufficiency of cold water, which Noah had poured over her head and shoulders. "'Oh, Charlotte! What a mercy! We have not all been murdered in our beds!' "'Ah, oh, mercy indeed, ma'am!' was the reply. I only hope this will teach Master not to have any more of these dreadful creatures that are born to be murderers and robbers from their very cradle. Oh, poor Noah! He was all but killed, ma'am, when I came in. Oh, poor fellow! said Mrs. Sowerberry, looking piteously on the charity boy. Noah, whose top waistcoat button might have been somewhere on a level with the crown of Oliver's head, rubbed his eyes with the inside of his wrists, while this commiseration was bestowed upon him and performed some affecting tears and sniffs. "'What's to be done?' exclaimed Mrs. Sowerberry. "'Your master's not at home. There's not a man in the house, and he'll kick that door down in ten minutes.' Oliver's vigorous plunges against the bit of timber in question rendered this occurrence highly probable, 
"'Dear, dear, I don't know, ma'am,' said Charlotte, "'unless we send for the police officers.' "'Or oh, the military,' suggested Mr. Claypole. "'No, no,' said Mrs. Sowerberry, bethinking herself of Oliver's old friend. "'Run to Mr. Bumble, Noah, and tell him to come here directly, not to lose a minute. Never mind your cap. Make haste. You can hold a knife to that black eye as you run along. It will keep the swelling down.' Noah stopped to make no reply, but started off at his fullest speed, and very much had astonished the people who were out walking to see a charity boy tearing through the streets pell-mell, with no cap on his head, and a clasp-knife at his eye. 